The aim of Chat and Connect is to get away from the, the standard networking event format. Um, the aim is to try and give you some things to think about, have some conversations, and uh, what we will do is we'll use the chat box, which if you're not familiar with on Zoom is usually located on the bottom toolbar there. Um, and we ask you to we'll ask you at various points in the conversation to get you all to um, to log in and say some things. So as you log it, as you comment there, we'll shout out and maybe ask one or two of you to join the conversation. Um, so can I start you actually, if you haven't already told us where you are, uh, if I can ask you just to open up the chat box on your screen and just type in where you are in the world, whereabouts in the world are you sitting, just so that we get a sense of who's here, where you are, and um, we can get jealous of those of you who are sitting in Barbados where it's nice and warm. We also add um, just one word of how you're feeling, just to get a sense. How you're, how's your day been in one word? And alliteration gets rewarded. Thank you. So we've got Louise, Edge of York. She's been busy. Uh, Sarah Simmons, hey everyone. I'm based in the East and the North Hertfordshire NHS Trust, feeling tired. Sunny Derbyshire, what a frantic day. Nana in London, feeling lovely. Nottingham, feeling full of fun. That's Alice. Chris, London, a rewarding day. Ooh, I'd like to hear more about that. Anthony, Newcastle, feeling tired. Danielle, also feeling tired in Doncaster. Paul is in Brighton. Welcome, Paul. I'm in Brighton too. Um, feeling like this is a welcome break from work. Hurrah! That's what we're trying to get. And Megan S. London, also tired. So half tired, half fun, and a few being had a rewarding day. Oh, um, someone's at their living room table in South East London. Uh, North Warwickshire, Helen, welcome. And Amy in, um, I was going to say Manchester. Oh, sorry. <laughs> in Kent. You've already told us that. Um, tired out, but um, glad to be on this call. So yeah, just to reiterate what Liam said, this is really your time for an hour to make connections, look around the bingo card of faces or names you might or might not know, do make connections, do offer to link in if people say things that resonate with you. We want this to be interactive and ongoing beyond the call. Um, um, over to you, Liam. Okay, and we're going to do, in a moment or two, I'm going to give you a second or two to think about it. We're also going to ask you um, the question, what was the most significant change to communications practice that you have seen in the last year? So get your thinking hats on, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So thinking about what is the most significant change to communication practice you've seen in the last year. Um, and obviously uh, the other last thing I'd like to point out to you is the participants box, which if you can click on it, you'll see the, the number of people there and you'll see who's in the room. And so you can have a few side conversations if you want to. Um, it's a bit like one of those very um, those those 1970s nightclubs where you could dial up another table and chat to them. If there's someone in the room who's got some expertise or experience, you can you can connect directly with them as well. Um, but have a look, see who's there. Some interesting um, people around joining us uh, today. So thank you very much. So um, so finally, um, we're going to be recording the session. So uh, just to let you know. And that means that later on, uh, you can dial back and say, I can't believe I actually heard Liam say that outrageous thing. And you've got the evidence to prove it or see me getting stressed when uh, when the conversation, when we run out of time and we haven't got around to asking all the questions we wanted to ask. So, um, so let's just uh, post that question in the chat box. Um, um, and I will, I'm afraid I haven't got it already cut and pasted in. Uh, Annabelle, would you mind just posting that question in about the I most significant that. change that people have seen in the last year. So I'm I am Debbie uh, McGee after all. Thank you very much. That's that's excellent for you. And um, later on, you'll get to see my look of terror as, as, as Annabelle takes us completely off, off piece as usual. So that's great. So today we're going to focus on government and public sector internal communications. And it's great to see a really good representative of communicators from the public sector and government here today. Um, now, the, the normal format is we get a conversation flowing with our three guests um, and then uh, we ask you to chip in and we join in the conversation as we go. Normally it works. It hasn't been utterly chaotic so far. And usually if people are, are happy to chip in and share their thoughts, we normally get some really interesting insights and ideas flowing. So sometimes um, feel free to just comment, but keep an eye on that chat box. Um, so our first guest today is, is Louise, Louise Bell, and she leads uh, Cross uh, Whitehall Communications. Um, 
I first connected with Louise uh, when she was at DEFRA. Um, and before that, she was with Natural England. So I'm, I'm, I think we can safely assume that, that Louise kind of quite likes getting outdoors occasionally. I don't know if that's the case. Uh, so welcome, Louise, up in there in York. Um, she's an, exge uh, an exge uh, engaged for success champion, and we're going to ask her about that. And you're also an avid consumer of anything that she can find that can highlight good practice, which is how we connected originally. Um, so but tell us, you must have seen, what's the biggest practice change that you've seen in the last year, Louise? What do you think? Uh, hi, Liam. Hi, everybody on the call. Really nice to meet you virtually. Um, so I think um, there's been a massive shift um, in communication generally for government, um, seeing us move from quite passive communications around campaign activity um, to at the forefront of um, doing lots of press conferences external, externally because in response to the coronavirus. Um, but from an internal communications perspective, um, obviously we did have some, some hybrid working already in terms of some people working within an office and some people working remotely. Um, but the coronavirus response has obviously resulted in the majority of us working from home. So I think how um, my role has definitely changed is looking at how we use digital tools um, to stay connected, um, but also importantly, make sure that our staff stay connected, um, make sure that they've got support with well-being um, okay. because we're working remotely. Um, we're doing coffee chats, informal activities that can keep people engaged, such as quizzes, okay. um, and really looking at new ways how we can sort of um, just increase engagement with our staff in remote ways. So we're going to pick up on that in a bit in a little while. So thank you very much. Annabelle, who else have we got? Thanks. We have the lovely Marcus Christostomou. And uh, I warmed very much to Marcus because he revealed that by day he wears his day slippers and in the evening he wears his evening slippers, <laughs> the new working from home um, mode. Um, but other than that, he um, does many important things. He's the chair of the PRCA public sector group. And for those of you that aren't in that group, well worth joining um, if you have an interest in government affairs, obviously. Um, he's worked in the public and private sector for two decades, uh, experience in Downing Street Press Office, so I'm sure if we um, twist some elbows we might get some snippets from life in number 10. And other go government departments, he's run his own business, he's worked at a number of local authorities in senior roles, and he's currently working at Westco Comms, and where he's supporting Havering Council as head of comms. So really interesting um, experience of national government and local government. So first kick off question to you, Marcus, uh, and just in brief, because we're going to come back to you for, for more questioning. But similarly, that question, what have you seen changed in comms practice over the last year? Yeah, hello from me, and I'm in Kent as well. So it's good to see Kent's got a bit of a show in. Um, I totally agree with Louise. Um, uh, I mean, local government has been kind of uh, responding to what national government has been asking us to do. So you know, we've been uh, massively up in our comms, been very proactive. Um, from a staff point of view, um, we have uh, a mix of staff working from home, but also we've got people on the front line as well because we're still having to deliver things like rubbish collection, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, so what's changed for us is very similar to what Louise has said. Um, you know, we're using more, more new tools to reach our audience. Uh, interestingly enough, we were, we were making that move from working in the office to working from home anyway. And this is what it's forced us to do is be more rapid than that. So, um, you know, we were kind of using Skype, you know, or, you know, but suddenly we're, we're all on Teams, you know, and the band, we've all gone on the cloud now and the bandwidth has massively expanded so we can all communicate with each other much, uh, much in a much better way. Um, the, uh, one of the challenges still is trying to reach the staff that are on the front line. So, you know, the other thing is, is uh, looking at how we reach them. And the final thing I'd say is, um, you know, better use of data on our staff. So, you know, one of the things that we're doing is we're gathering more data uh, more often about who our staff are. And that's everything from health conditions because of COVID uh, to have they got the right kit at home. You know, so there's a lot of welfare and engagement activity taking place. And, you know, we never used to have this, but we now do health and safety checks every three months on our staff, for example. And that's, that's not something yeah. we used to do. So, 
So they're kind of the biggest changes for us. A lot's happened in a year. It's really accelerated and driven yeah. agendas. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I'd, I'd say very quickly, the, the other thing I think that's really changed is um, us being more agile. So in the old days, you know, when you get to try and get someone out of a meeting or whatever, now, because we're all online, things happen more quickly and bureaucracy has, has been limited uh, because we have to do things at speed. So um, we're all a lot more agile than we used to be as well. Okay. Not that I'm physically agile, more, you know, technology agile. <laughs> Well, I've got a bike in the background. Because <laughs> that's, that's great, um, Liam. Oh, that's oh, well, that's uh, quite a nice um, segue actually to to Paul because I imagine Paul's year has been uh, quite interesting. So Paul's joining us from uh, from Brighton, obviously. Paul Inglefield is uh, from the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. Um, Paul's career covers, um, as well as working, obviously, for the, the, the uh, UK regulator for the healthcare industry and, and medicines, Paul brings a massive background in um, in the arena of local government, having, I think you've worked at pretty well every level of local government, haven't you, apart from Hanford Parish Council, haven't you, Paul? Um, I think you've worked everywhere. I've lost him. Is he gone? Oh, you're on mute there, Paul. Yeah. Oh, so, right. Sorry, I might have missed something there, Liam. Did you want me to come in there? I no, think no, I, went I, was just, I was just saying you... <laughs> <laughs> I, was just, I was just demonstrating I had the authority I was making. I was, I was saying you've worked at virtually every level of local government, apart from Hanford Parish Council. Um, yes. So. I, I do have some experience in parish councils. I haven't actually worked for them, but I have been in meetings, but not 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 as bad as the one that you're referring to. Not quite as entertaining as that one. No, and, definitely not. And, um, so, but obviously, uh, we're going to be talking to Paul a bit later. Paul's been at the uh, at the regulator that's been the centre of of COVID, I think. And on top of that, you've also had to deal with a. Um, the, the whole Brexit thing as well, as you've you know been unraveling the UK regulatory framework from the wider European uh, EU one. So that's uh, so hopefully we'll pick up a little bit on how that affected how you communicate. I guess you've seen some changes in comps practice in the last year yourself, Paul. Then. Yeah, just 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 a bit. I was just re remembering them when I first met you. Actually, I think you came and did a talk for us while I was at Camden Council a long time ago. So uh, it's uh, nice to connect up again uh, since then. Um, but yeah, I mean things have changed a lot. We we were we we're quite an interesting organisation, and we did actually do quite a lot of remote working before COVID. I mean, I worked at home two straight three days a week, and a lot of other people did. So um, we kind of switched to that that kind of way of working um, quite quickly and without wanting to repeat what Louise and Marcus have said, you know, the stuff about well-being engagement, really, really, really important. And we've had um, probably about 900 of our staff have been working at home, but we also have um, laboratories and scientists and they have actually been going in right throughout the period as well. So we've had to sort of balance our um, internal communications uh, t towards them as well. But I think from, from an internal comms point of view, if, if that's what you want to concentrate on for a little bit, is uh, we've um, we've had to really, really change the way that we've worked. We've had we've we've been running um, monthly all staff meetings for our for our 1400 staff, um, which has been quite a challenge, just one after the other leadership meetings, managers meetings, lots of more video content, had to work really, really hard to keep staff engaged. Um, so that's been quite challenging for quite a small internal communications team. And then on the external stuff, just quickly, we've had to run, you know, virtual news conferences. Um, we, we've, we've done a couple at um, number 10 and that was great because they did it all for us. But we've also had to run them ourselves and they're, 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 they're quite uh, tricky things to run if you've not run them before. So, so that's been a, quite a big challenge for our staff. I think, I think the main thing uh, around our communications team, which is not, not particularly huge, is that we've had to become much more multi-skilled and do lots more different things than we did before. So those kind of disciplines have become more blurred, actually, over the last year. And people have just rolled their sleeves up and got on with it and put their resource and time into the things that matter the most for us. What do you mean the boundaries between the <laughs> different types of communications? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so for we, I mean, we've we have we have got a bigger press team now than we did have, but we've had to take people from uh, other areas and put them onto our prep. We have a news and digital content team, so props responsible for our kind of web and digital offering as well as the media side, and we've had to take people off. So, for example, we have an events team which has got three people in it. We run about 
40 events a year, income generating events. We've had, obviously, once uh, COVID came, the face-to-face -face one stopped and we didn't take us a while to build up the virtual ones. So we took the three events team, picked them off them and put them into, into our digital content team. I uh, had to train them up in those skills. Um, so that's one, one um, area where we've had to move people over. Uh, uh, we, which has been really successful. Um, so, uh, so it's been good that the team have been responsive and managed to meet those challenges. All right. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, we'll pick up a bit more on that in a minute. And so, and um, can I just? I, so, I'm going to come first to, to Louise because um, you you already uh, we, one of the participants mentioned that she'd already started a new job and never actually been in the office. So I've forgotten who that was. You started a new job in the new year, didn't you, Louise? That was uh, it's a funny old year. And um, what's your new role all about? The one you've uh, switched across to? Um, so actually, my role isn't too different from the role that I was doing in um, DEFRA. Um, my role um, is um, change communications um, predominantly. Um, so the, the main difference is, is that it's across Whitehall. So working with lots of departments rather than just DEFRA. Um, so, um, yes, lots of um, sort of familiarising myself with the different tools um, that people use. I've not seen my team in person yet. They're all in London. Um, so being in New York, that's been a real opportunity for me to sort of um, have that additional opportunity. Um, but we connect in lots of different ways virtually and um, like, like the others have mentioned through sort of Google Meet and um, other things. So you've, um, and a part of that's actually been about, you mentioned before when we were talking uh, last week and just before now, you said digital obviously been a large part of, um, of your world. Um, yes. And so, I mean, it, I was quite curious. I mean, are your stakeholders really ready to embrace the full opportunities that uh, that digital has come? What's the journey been like? I think sort of there's got. To, I mean, I'm quite passionate about um, the opportunities that digital and IT bring. Um, smarter, better, faster. Um, I wouldn't say sort of. Um, had somebody asked me a few years ago, do I like IT? I'd probably say I leave it to my sons. I don't have a clue. I don't use a PlayStation or anything like that. Um, but actually, digital, and um, particularly nowadays, um, because of the coronavirus, has really sort of. Um, brought us huge opportunities for staying connected um, but also allowing us um, flexibility to spend time with our family so um, I think I've been really open to trying new digital tools so I've just been testing Miro with interactive workshops because we haven't been able to do the traditional whiteboard in a meeting room sort of workshops um, so running an hour a long call with a large group of people um, there's got to be that willingness to try different things. So I've been quite fortunate, really, um, yeah. bringing them in in different ways, such as we just ran a myth busting quiz, um, which was quite fun to do digitally. Um, but um, in terms of people being willing, out my sort of um, audiences being willing to try digital tools, um, it is a journey um, for people. Um, people are familiar with using sort of local spreadsheets um, and it's habit forming as well. So demonstrating that, just showing them that we're there to support them, um, yeah. but also to letting them know that it's not perfect um, and that we're continuously evolving digital tools to make them work in different ways for different people um, has been a real benefit and giving them an opportunity to influence how we use it. Yeah. I, I found um because I was doing a workshop yesterday with uh, with some people and they were saying and they were all comms people and they were not in government but not private sector either and they were sort of saying one of their challenges was the slight discomfort their stakeholders had their their internal stakeholders had in in actually the rollout of some of the tools uh to to the workforce in general and it, they were saying it was quite hard work getting their leaders to kind of really embrace step up to it you know it wasn't the employees weren't the challenge it was getting leaders to to step up to the digital tools. has that been the experience of your end um i think there's definitely some sort of um in terms of the audience segmentation piece 
there's definitely sort of um, just seeing sort of how people interact. And um, I know we're probably going to speak about measurement later, um, but looking at the priority people that you need to identify that perhaps need a little bit more handholding, who are really crucial um, to input it, to sort of getting involved with a digital system. Um, working with them to, to overcome barriers and any challenges that they're personally experiencing, I think is important. Right. And we spoke the other day about uh, about the challenges of working with multiple different departments. And you're you're in this kind of quite interesting realm. You're you're working with with very di you know different. Di what are the what are the big challenges of working with different departments? I'm guessing there must be things like technology or culture around comms. What are the big yeah. challenges? So um, in, in government, um, different departments use different digital tools. So it's definitely been sort of um, a real learning process that process and um, trial and error of what works. Um, so for instance, um, the team that I'm working with were initially using Zoom, a free account, which meant that um, after 40 minutes, they just get cut off mid flow, which isn't great for two way interactions. Um, so trialing Microsoft Teams has been quite useful, um, but as a, also part of the survey follow up is asking people what tools they use within their own departments. Um, so and we use that then to inform our approach, um, even surveys. Um, so some staff um, use Qualtrics, some staff use Smart Survey, some staff use Google Forms, and finding a solution that works for every department has been really interesting um, and a lot of fun. <laughs> is that because they, is it just because they've always done it that way, or is it because they have different reasons why they might use Google Forms versus, you know, Qualtrics or whatever? I think so. I mean, in DEFRA, we, we used um, Microsoft Teams, um, but within my current department, we work on Google Meet. And I don't know if there's any reason, you know, sort of background to that, um, but it's definitely a hurdle as an internal communicator. I'm looking to try and overcome um, to make sure that um, we can break down some of those barriers of cross departmental working. Um, so for instance, we've just done a re really good show and tell of another department to help break down some of those sort of departmental silos, um, which has been a lot of fun to do and um, really well engaged with. Um, yeah. And you you mentioned that you um, you spend, you know, you're very interested in the Engage for Success agenda. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about that. Um, so the Engage for Success um, is something that I've been passionate about because it works in so, on so in so many different ways on so many different types of projects. So I've done change communications for a real broad range of things from um, estate moves, um, smarter ways of working, um, creation of virtual incident rooms for environment agency in response to the pandemic. Um, to sort of um, adoption of digital tools. So um, there's four key enablers um, and um, having that strong strategic narrative, um, it's really important that we make clear that um, we're not doing change for change sake. Um, there's a reason. So where we're we coming from, where we're we going to and why, um, engaging leaders, having employee voice, that's around two-way interaction and authenticity. Um, so that's that piece about writing on the wall being the same as what people experience on the ground. Um, so having open conversations with staff about what they will experience as a result of perhaps a digital change, um, such as um, the move to sort of Office 365, Exchange Online, and being open and honest about um, the issues that might crop up along the way. Okay. And employee voice, finally. Um... Are you seeing big variations in how departments approach the challenges of employee voice? And um, if so, what kind of are the drivers of those? I think sort of every department um, wants to have that employee play, employee voice, that two way interaction. Um, but I think as an internal communicator, I think sort of our role is really valuable in facilitating that. And um, such as a team that I'm working with currently, um, they sort of had low levels of engagement. It was all very one way communication. Um, so as a result of boosting that employee voice and that interaction opportunity to influence and get involved, we've seen that number increase to sort of over 40. 
and our surveys tell us that 100% of people attending um, now, you know, want to attend again, whereas previously it was I might attend again. Um, so it's really good to see that positive change as a result of just adjusting our technique. Of just and um, and gathering in the feedback and presumably sharing that with. Uh, yeah, and I should say as well, because it's important, is that making sure that we use that feedback is really, really important. You said we did. Um, so making sure that we respond to the feedback that we receive and um, so that people can see that we're using it is crucial. Well, thank you very much for that. And um, don't forget, folks, to um, put some comments in the comment box as you go and uh, any reactions or further questions that you might have. And we'll we'll bring those up uh, either directly to people as they're talking or as we um, uh, later on in the conversation. So, Annabelle. Right. Thanks, Lindsay. Really interesting and really um, good that you touched on the new tools you're using. In fact, Lindsay had a question, which perhaps if you're still there, Lindsay, do you want to unmute? Yes. And perhaps one for Marcus uh, around tools. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm actually in private sector, so I'm sort of impostering into um, your group today. So well, but it's really interesting. Um, it was just a question really regarding the new digital tools that you're using, with the exception of Teams and, and Zoom, uh, are there any other interesting, cost-effective, not eye-wateringly expensive digital tools that you can perhaps recommend? Um, and secondly, just another question is, again, we've got staff who are working from home, but we've also got production engineers and operatives who are still in the factory. At the best of times, I struggle to get engagement from that group of people. Um, does anybody have any advice of particularly at the minute, you know, we do a town hall video call and, and the chairs are wheeled into the canteen and you can see the production engineers are sitting there and they look bored to tears. Now, I know that that's going to be largely to do with, with tone, with content, with relevance, but any inspiration as to how you can just get a little bit of spark amongst those groups that traditionally maybe aren't quite so engaged? Thanks, Lindsay. If people want to put down in the chat their thoughts on tools and how to engage perhaps more tricky to engage audiences, that'd be really useful to hear your comments. But Marcus, do you want to uh, have a go at answering those two points Lindsay's raised? Yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, we. Uh, Working at the, council, at the council, we have a similar issue where, you know, we've got probably about, I don't know, about half or maybe two thirds of our workforce at home. So that they're easier to, to reach. But we also have a workforce who are out, out on the ground and hard to reach. So, you know, they're street cleaners, you know, rubbish collection or whatever. Um, and it's, it's we, we, even when, when we weren't in COVID, we struggled with this. And, you know, it, when we weren't in COVID times, then we, we used a few different ways of, of reaching them. So we had, you know, uh, a day when we invited them all into the town hall or whatever. Um, but there was something that worked pre-COVID, which was getting them involved in um, competition, like a table tennis competition, that kind of stuff. So giving them an excuse. Um, and it tends to be that a lot of the people who work on the ground are men. And... Um, uh, otherwise, most most of the rest of the council, as funny as on this conversation earlier on today, um, it's more women than men working from from home. So although there are men, but as as the work the way the the council is split, there's more men on the ground. I also run a men's forum, and it's actually just as difficult to um, engage with them through the men's forum as it is for for internal comms. Um, one of the things we're looking at is. Um, we're, we're moving uh, our internet over to SharePoint, for example, and SharePoint, you can get on your phone. So, you know, you can, you can uh, most people have a mobile phone and, you know, we're, look, we're looking at um, ensuring they can access all, all the news that we, you know, we put out to the organisation on SharePoint um, and they can access it through phones. Use text, WhatsApp, you know, um, as to whether you have engage them and get them to be interested in stuff, um, it's hard. Um, in, in the current world, but what we're trying to do is use case studies, get their own people to speak to them. So it's not always, um, you know, it's not always a chief exec or, you know, some from the, from the um, 
comms or someone like that is, is try and encourage them to speak to people they know well um, and people that represent them as well. So there's some of the challenges we, we face. And then finally, um, you know, a lot of them, many of them have good old fashioned email as well. You know, when they go home, they might look at it. It's a personal email. So um, the other, another piece of work we've done for our HR department is um, talk to the hard to reach groups and get their personal emails so we can communicate with them outside of the normal channels because a lot of them don't have a laptop or a computer because they're not using them. So, so they're the kind of the things that we're doing. So that may or may not help you. Thanks, Marcus. Um, that was one of my questions I was going to ask you how to reach your hard to reach audiences. But coming on to looking at your experience, you've had the advantage of working both at national level and local government levels. What are the nuances, the differences you would say if anybody perhaps looking to jump from one to the other or we've got some students on the call too who might be interested in launching their career one direction or the other. What are the, the subtle differences would you say? Well I'll, I'll speak from a personal point of view. Um, so um, I mean I started my career in the civil service in Northern Nine office, Northern Nine office before I went into comms and I got into comms by accident. So um, I used to work, my second job was the correspondence section at Downing Street and then from there, I got into the press office. Um, and my my job used to be managing all the protocols with Prime Minister and press events, all that kind of stuff. Which um, so very, what year was that? Which um, that that was 1992 ish. It's when John Major was in power, and then I was there when Tony Blair came in as well. Um, so I saw two different types of government. Um, and you know, for me, it was an amazing time. You know, really really enjoyed it. Um, and you know, when you work somewhere like there. Um, you don't have to create a story you are you know there's always a story you know it's never difficult to be in the media and you know you have you having twice briefings with the meet with the media and the rest of it um but then i jumped to it's now been closed down the central office information and um our job was doing regional comms for government departments and that was a completely different ball game and you know there you had to work hard to get a story out there so if you did things like a ministerial visit, that was easy. You know, you tend to get the local media turn up or rest of it. But when you get, um, and we worked a bit like a government, like an agency. So one of my clients was a health and safety executive. And one of the most exciting jobs was um, the Safe Ladders campaign. Now that was really fun, you know, trying to get people engaged in safe ladders. And we did it, it was great. Um, so, you know, I suppose the difference between that and local government, I mean, I moved to local government because it's the old cliche of, I want to do something for the citizen a bit more. So, you know, personally, I find found that working in national government, and I totally enjoyed it and loved it. I felt, you know, you're a bit more detached from what's going on on the ground. So, you know, you're working on a national basis or, um, you know, a regional basis, and you're dealing with regional national media, and you're in that bubble. So, you know, in the Westminster bubble or whatever bubble you happen to be in. Um, uh, the politics is really different as well. So when you make a move to local government, um, you're closer to poli the politics of what's happening on the ground. So national government, you're dealing with ministers, and I, you know, I worked with ministers. I did quite a number of secondments. I worked in what was called the ODP ODPM in those days. Um, I worked at DEFRA. I worked at DFID, and they all had their own, you know, but it was very, you know, you were a civil servant, and you knew, knew what your role was, and ministers, you know, you had private, se private sectors and the rest of it, and you had the system in place. But when you go to local government, you know, I'm a jack of all trades now. I do everything, you know, and you know, I'm helping to form policy. I'm helping to deliver policy. You know, you're, you're, you're a counsellor, you're an advisor. Um, you've got lots of different roles to play. You know, we do everything from internal comms, external comms. You know, some, some local government teams are five, three people. Others are big. You know, you could be in a county council. I was a county council and I had a really good sized team, you know, and so resources are completely different as well. And the tools you can get and the money you can get. So there was more money in national government than was in local government. That's just my experience. Um, yeah. Plenty of differences. I could talk all day. If you come <laughs> to Havering Council in particular, what campaign have you been most proud of that's had biggest impact? You've mentioned Havering Heroes to me through the pandemic. What yeah, from in from internal comms of point of view, um, I mean, you know, the pandemic has changed uh, the way we all work absolutely. And you know, I was saying that on about being more agile and keeping in touch with staff. Now, you know, one of the other differences between local and national government is you tend to find, I mean, sixty percent of the staff that work at the council live in the borough. 
you know so when you work in national government you know if you're in london they can come from anywhere ken you know wherever um so you know they're your ambassadors as well you know they're, they're living in the borough you know they've got family in the borough so you know you pass them messages they can be passing them on but you know with covid um many people had to change their roles so comms has been I think comms has been recognised more now than it has ever been before because of COVID, because we've had a massive role to play. Um, but a lot of staff, their jobs have changed. So if you're, in a, if you're a library worker, for example, libraries are closed. So, you know, some staff are furloughed. So that's one issue trying to communicate with them. But secondly, staff are also remobilised into other roles. So dealing with, um, you know, uh, clinically the people who needed help, you know, taking phone calls, um, helping with, you know, getting food to people. So everyone's role changed. So one of the things we looked at is um, who are our heroes? So, mm -hmm. you know, we and, and it was actually a, a dual uh, external and internal campaign. So celebrate the, we called them Haven Heroes. Um, celebrate who those heroes are, getting some really good case studies of people that have gone above and beyond duty. And in fact, that was just about everybody and they're still doing it. Um, but, you know, really identifying those those people who, you know, have changed what they're doing or what, you know, what, what they've been doing and making sure they're, they're depicting the things that you expect people to do. So wearing the mask or, you know, doing the things that you want people yeah. to follow as well. So um, really successful. And we got to the point where people were sending, sending in heroes to us. We weren't going out to find them. They were coming to us. That might be um, a very nice thing for Lindsay, uh, if you're still listening, to think about with your production engineers to get them to tell their stories and to nominate to, to let, bring that level of engagement in. Um, just a reminder to everyone, do look at the chat. There's some really interesting comments coming in. Some, some essays are being written in there. So do have a look if you get a chance. Um, so one final question for you, Marcus. Um, what would you say you've learned about comms? How have you changed as a leader through the pandemic? Uh, yeah, it's a really good question, actually. Um, I mean, I'm I'm having to be more agile in what I do, but also I'm having to delegate more and depend on my team more to, you know, deliver things. Because, um, I mean, when you're in a crisis, it's very much about command and control. And and the other challenge about us all working from home is we spend all our time in meetings on Zoom or wherever, whatever, you know, Teams or whatever. Um, so I don't have as much headspace or time to to physically do some of the stuff that I used to do before, because um, I'm involved in lots of different bronze groups and God knows what else. So I'm delegating more down to my team mm -hmm. um, and hopefully empowering them more to do more as well. So, you know, one of the lessons, so it's a really difficult task. So as a leader, you know, you have lots of roles to play as a leader. And, you know, when you go into crisis, you go straight into command and control. So I've had to try and make sure I'm not always in command and control zone. And I am, you know, I am delegating, I am, you know, counselling, I am supporting, um, I am trying to bring the rest of the team in when I can. But sometimes you ain't got the time, you know, and that's, and that's one of the challenges. But actually, what's really good, I've got good people below me, and they're doing some of the things that I may have been doing, you know, a year ago. So yeah. and they're, that's bringing them up as well. Fantastic. It's an opportunity to step up, in effect. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and I just saw a comment about Yammer, and um, Yammer's great but you don't always get all buy-in by everybody i mean we, we've always struggled to get everyone to buy into yammer i can see so, it you know, yeah it's one of our tools that we reach staff with it's not the only tool yeah. and actually we get more people respond to chief executives weekly email than we do from our internet uh, from our um email we do to all staff three times a week so because it's personal and it's a person yeah and, uh, you know we have quite a lot of traction with that I wonder if that resonates with Paul. I'm going to hand over to you, Liam. Thanks very much, Marcus. Um, do keep an eye on the chat yeah. box in case any other questions come in for you. Thank you. Yeah, I have to say I'm I'm not the world's biggest fan of Yammer because one one role I had for it kind of keeping the Yammer beast fed was sucked the life out of me, and I was just thinking it was just this burden. You know, it should have been so wonderful, but it was just a nightmare. But I'm sure people will tell us. The thoughts of, Paul, I mean, you, you've, I mean, I'm guessing that internal comms is quite a major passion of yours. Um, you know, we've, we've crossed paths quite a few times on this subject. 
Yeah, well, absolutely it is. Um, and I was really interested to hear um, Louise speak earlier on about um, Engage for Success and the, the enablers and, um, and, and, and the, the great work that's been done by, you know, David McLeod and Peter Clark around that. And I, I, I even though it's probably uh, well, 15 years old now, I imagine, I still swear by it. It's just a fantastic kind of baseline to, um, I think, to, uh, to to bring into your work. And, and, and one of the things that I'm quite passionate about in doing that is trying to um, get that message over to uh, internal communicators about how they can use engagement to leverage more out of internal comms uh, for an organisation and work with kind of other colleagues like HR, etc. Um, so while um, in my job uh, I'm responsible for the internal communication team and I spend quite a bit of my time working on it, I have um, you know a number of other um, challenges that I that I divert, divert me off of that I suppose. But it is my it, it, it's 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 something that I feel um, quite passionate about because I think um, and I always say to people that I think out of all the communications disciplines that are out there, this is the most important one because. Uh, and it's it's always the poor neighbour, I think, for anyone that works in internal communications will know. And I think one of the great things that the PCS has tried to do over the last sort of four or five years is to really, um, you know, kind of ramp up the importance of internal communications and let people see that it's not something you do if you can't be a press officer, but it's something that you can do um, uh, as, as a chosen career path um, because it can make such a difference to an organisation's reputation and you can, you know, you can send out tons and tons of news releases and you might get a bit of profile out of them, but the reality is, of course, is when somebody uh, picks up the phone and walks into an office and, and that kind of moment of truth, as it's called, of whether the person dealing with that call or that inquiry um, actually understands what the organisation's about and um, what its business objectives are, what its brand is about and can deliver that on the front line. And that's where... Um, internal communications can play a really, really important role helping organisations deliver their, their business strategy. Yeah, and, and before I ask you about um, about the um, the European uh, Brexit, your Brexit experience, I guess I should actually tell everyone full disclosure that uh, Paul is the, runs a lot of the PRCA's internal comms courses and for a long time you were the, the moving force behind IC Space, which is, you know, this fantastic resource which I spend a lot of time recommending to people around the world, not just in government, uh, not just in the UK. There's there's tons of great resource on there. If you've not already, I'm guessing everyone on this call probably is familiar with IC Space, but if you're not, there's there's some brilliant stuff in there and um, is well worth it. Let me just ask you though, because you've been through uh, before COVID came along, you were having quite a uh, interesting time, shall we say, because you had the whole. Uh, un uncoupling from the European Medicine Agency. How's that been? Uh, what's it been like, and how's that worked? Well, and what's the impact that's had on internal comms and engagement? Well, uh, it's a good question, Liam. And um, I mean, if I'm honest with you, it's been, I mean, it, it's it's been a big emotional journey for the organisation in total because we were so. Um, connected into the European Medicines Agency. In fact, our organisation was the leading regulator in across Europe by by some measure. Uh, we had uh, you know many more expert staff and all the kind of really complicated pieces of medicines regulation that that were needed for Europe. We we generally did them. Um, and so coming away from that has been difficult for a lot of staff and, and even communications. Um, as a, you know, you won't be surprised. There was a, a, a heads of medicines communications uh, group, you know, that for the for the, for the, um, the, the 27, 28 members, and we we you know we chaired that and we led that. So any response to a medicines recall or an adverse reaction is is, is dealt with at a European level because you know it's the same medicine and the same people taking it. That of course is gone, and I think it's been really really difficult for a lot of staff to come to terms with it. But because it went on for such a long time. It started obviously after the referendum where people were just speculating like crazy about what that would mean. In the end, if I'm honest, I think the organisation kind of burnt itself out because there were never any answers to the questions that we wanted until the very, very last moment. As everybody knows, the deal wasn't sealed until just before uh, the end of last year. Um, and so people in the end lost interest in it um, in, in lots of ways and just resigned themselves to it. And it had a very demotivating 
Um, uh, it was a demotivating experience for a lot of our staff and, and quite a lot of our gifted um, clinicians, uh, uh, you know, actually left and moved on because they just didn't want to work in that in that level of uncertainty. Um, but in terms of uh, the, the other big pressure that it brought us, we're, we're a, um, a traded a traded business, so we don't um, get hardly any grant from government. Where most of the um, resource we get is money that we earn from charging pharmaceutical industry for regulating, and we've and it's created a huge. Uh, gap in our funding, um, about 23 odd million pounds, which we've now uh, going to have to change our organisation um, quite um, significantly in order to um, to meet that. And the new challenges of being a standalone regulator outside of Europe. Um, so it's it, it's been it's been quite challenging. If you asked about internal communications, well, I think uh, one of the challenges was, was trying to keep people's interest up. At first, anything we ran, we we had queues around the to get in and hear about what was going on but in the end we were running kind of open lunch and learns and things like that we were getting two or three people turning up to them because people just you know just it just sapped everything out of them it, it, it when it got when it got nearer to the to the moment really towards the end of last year then people did start to become much more interested in it particularly the issues around northern ireland which has created huge amounts of problems for us um and and uh, and obviously the, the kind of covid and vaccine stuff um which i think we're going to come on to a bit later but you know that obviously has meant um significant challenges yeah i can imagine that the, that whole change agenda when you actually don't know the answer at the end of it that must be it must be a massive struggle but but then you they so to dial back a year you've got all that going on in the background and then suddenly covid kicks off um and um, that must have been it must have been a very interesting time in terms of the pressures on you, because I can imagine there's an awful lot of, you know, the spotlight suddenly turns on you in a way that um, probably you didn't necessarily need it at that time. <laughs> well, I think that's right. I mean, you know, I'll forgive anyone in this meeting for not knowing who the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulation Agency uh, was or is. I mean, certainly before I started there, I, I hadn't really heard of it. And I was really impressed that you managed it to roll off your tongue earlier on, Liam. You were probably practicing to get that right. Um, you know, we just basically, <laughs> we just kind of work under the radar to be honest if you're doing our job um you know and and you know every now and then a big issue would come up like the, the breast implants you, you pop colleagues might remember that and certainly uh, medicines that affect um, women who are pregnant so every now and then there'll be a big issue that we would have to kind of rise and deal with but essentially we were we, we were not not that well known we just got on and did our job uh, and people just expected medicines to be regulated um you know correctly and and we also um we're not we don't just regulate medicines we also regulate devices which is a completely separate thing so anything from a wheelchair to a you know a needle and we also have a huge um, um biological standards um and scientific base as well so we've kind of and, and in addition we also have um, um, a kind of uh, a, a, a kind of big data team that, that basically use uh, the information of healthcare records and um, basically sell that off to pharma and other health organisations. So we're quite a mixed organisation with lots of different people going on, uh, lots of things going on. But I think that, that so the big challenge for us really as a, as a comms team was to try and respond to that. So something like, um, you know, the, the, one of the big things that we did like, towards the end of last year was to have an, a, a number 10 live press conference. I mean, you know, we never ever would have thought or dreamt that we would ever be doing anything like that. Um, and the, just the preparation that's required and the sign off uh, and the number of government advisors that you need to work with to just to get something that was probably quite straightforward from the outside world. You know, our chief executive rocks up with a couple of other people and tells us that we've um, approved a, a vaccine. But um, for anyone that's worked um, closely in government, will just know how, um, how 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 challenging that is. Particularly as we are an independent regulator, we're 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 an arm's length body. We're not, you know, we're part of the Department of Health, of course we are, but we're also independent, and people expect us to give independent advice about any medicine and sometimes that doesn't necessarily always chime with what a government minister or a government department wants and i think we've done a really good job um doing that so keeping our independence but also delivering really what the country needed which was um you know essentially emergency regulation of the vaccines but doing that um, without cutting corners you know just doing it really really quickly 
so I'll, I'll finish in a moment but i just i've been just humbled really by the, 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 the commitment and dedication not only of the um, people that have been assessing all these vaccines, working 70, 80, 90 hour weeks for month in and month out to get to get that done, but also our own communications team. You know, we, you've talked about some of the challenges around that. I mean, we've got eight people that have never actually been in the office. In fact, we've got two people that have been and left without being in the office since we started. Uh, and a lot of them are quite young. And I think, you know, working really, really long hours when you've got people rigging you up at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night for responses around this stuff has been very, very challenging. So that that point that was made earlier on um, about um, by, by both Marcus and Louise about care. And, and I felt, found my own kind of leadership style needing to just create time to um, just to check in with people regularly, really regularly to make sure that they're kind of OK. Um, and, um, and and they're getting the support and help that they need. Because a lot of young people, they're living on their own, they're working in their bedrooms, and we're expecting an awful lot of them. So um, that's been a big, big change for me and a big learning curve as well. I think um, <laughs> Louise made about the need to just be sensitive and better to people's well-being and stuff. Annabelle, um, um, what are people saying in the chat box? Um, Yes, we've had quite a few comments coming through. Um, Louise, thank you for pointing out that there's lots of resources on the GCS website, so do go to that if you haven't already accessed it. Um, Alex, are you there still to just raise your point around Facebook for those that aren't using it in the workplace? Here comes Alex. Hi. Uh, yeah, it was just a point about when the discussion about Yammer. Um, and I think Facebook is another is another option um, in that people are already familiar with it. It's on their phones uh, as a closed group. You could use it for, um, I think, whatever people want to do. But it's just a, as a way of getting people involved in a way that they may not otherwise choose to uh, engage with more official corporate channels. Uh, it, it wasn't work for everyone, but certainly it, it's something I think to consider because you're basically going where where the people already are and that obviously has a big advantage in terms of not having to um to break down the initial barrier of getting people to to uh download an app use it on their their work phone it's on their personal phone so i think it's just something uh, that's always worth considering uh, if it would work for for your own organization fantastic thank you alex for coming on the call um amy would you like to just raise your point of feeding off that point that alex has made on yammer um, yeah, I was just um, just thinking, um, obviously, because I'm quite new um, to Ofgem and also um, to um, being in a comms team as well. But my um, my previous um, job, um, Yammer was used a lot um, and especially even for sharing quite important key organisational information. Um, and I guess that's kind of why there was more sort of buy in, like pretty much everyone within the organisation was on there and using it regularly. Um, so even things like IT updates, if something had gone down, um, um, things from our CEO that need to be shared, we were also always told, you know, um, I run quite a lot of events. Every event that we did, we would share it on Yammer with photos and get people to just start a conversation about that. So there was a lot happening on there. And it was even something that was kind of put into our day that you would check it every day. Um so yeah, it's just something that I'm kind of wanting to bring into what I'm doing at Ofgem because um, I work in the strategic engagement team and um, the main programme that I work on is customer connections, which is bringing in the customer story and sharing that internally. Um, so one that's kind of what my next project is, is to, to start up a Yammer group and what we will be doing sharing it on Yammer and getting people to have those discussions about what they're doing on there um, and we'll be doing that fundraising campaign and things like that so when people are doing those activities sharing it on Yammer and um, taking photos and you know having that more social side of it. Fantastic well very best of luck with that and uh, thank if you anybody in the chat so do link in with them if they've had prior experience of Yammer I'm sure they'll be happy to have a, a longer chat with you. Liam you have a question. Oh, I'm just very conscious of the time and I just wanted to throw this to our, our okay. three guests, uh, to Marcus, to Louise and to Paul is um, 
obviously the role of communicators is changing massively and in the last minute or so that we have just do you see how have you seen the role change and where do you think it's going to go where's what's the future role of communicators in government and public sector going to look like from your perspective i'll throw that out to you um who's going to go first i'm going to i'm going to look at paul first and then i'll uh, then i'll go to marcus and louise paul tell me well, okay, I'll, I'll be I'll be super quickly. I mean, it's a really really good question, and I think you know what we've heard today is that it's changing really fast and probably beyond um, recognition. But I, for me, um, I think that the, the the new communicators of the you know the, the next uh, decade or so are going to need to really focus on things like um, insights, um, uh, being a strategic advisor, influencing. Um, a joiner upper, I think, is an important one where you can join various parts of the organisation up, really, really understand the business that you work in and also be very, very kind of business like in demonstrating how, um, you know, communications can help deliver uh, business objectives. Uh, insight is super important. Thank you very much. Well, Louise, you mentioned insight. What, how else do you see the role evolving? Um, I think sort of coronavirus has definitely demonstrated the sort of value of um, science being at the, you know, sort of at the centre of decision making, so digital and data. Um, but also I cannot, I, I think that we'll probably be increasingly using hybrid ways of working even after coronavirus pandemic has um, uh, hopefully concluded at some point in the future. Um, so digital tools for connecting people will remain something that we need to consider and think about. And, and, and Marcus, just wrap us up. Where yeah, do you I, agree, think? I agree with what everyone said. I mean, the only other thing I would, I would add is, uh, you know, one of the things we've seen through vaccine rollout, for example, is, you know, we're, we're having to be better at targeting particular groups and understanding more information about those groups. So yeah, data is absolutely important, but it's actually how you reach them. Because you know, we always talk about hard to reach groups and we've been talking about it for staff as well. Um, so um, we'll get better at doing that, hopefully. And then finally, I'll say, you know, as I said earlier on, comms has moved up the agenda. I think people realize how important comms is and hopefully the longer lasting effect is that, you know, people, you know, listen to comms as a strategic advisor rather than always saying, I know what I'm, you know, rather than everyone telling you they know about comms. So hopefully that, that's made a massive difference. Fantastic. Thanks, Marcus. I'm going to wrap up because we're at 6.01 and I'd like to finish on time. So one minute extra. Apologies. Thank you so much to all our guests for attending and thanks for everybody else who made the call tonight at the end of your busy days. Um, we will be sending out a two question pulse check talking of data to find out what you thought about the event and to seek views about future events and also to uh, invite you to suggest topics for future uh, events. We're going to be sending you the recording and also to flag May the 6th, Liam and I are going to be co-hosting the PRCA Employee Engagement Conference. It's going to be a conference with a difference, two till six on the 6th of May, so date for your diaries. Um, thanks once again, thanks to my co-host Liam Fitzpatrick and thank to Kiri at the PRCA for being a brilliant um, man all and, round. And thank you very much. Thanks so much everyone.